Okay, let me start by thanking the organizer for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to have the possibility of opportunity to uh, present here uh, the results uh, which uh, we achieved in my group. Uh, so the talk is about understanding strong correlation effects in spin-orbit T2G materials. Uh, as first talk, I was thinking uh, to uh, devote two slides to introduce the topic of strong correlation. Uh, Eric already uh, did that, but let me remind you uh, some main aspects. Uh, strongly correlated systems are those for which the single electron picture breaks down qualitatively. Consham eigenvalues do not provide a realistic electronic structure, and the strong correlation mostly arises from the local part of the Coulomb interaction. So uh, typically are compounds involving uh, atoms with partially filled D, uh, F, or sometimes P shells. And here I will focus on materials uh, which involve atoms in these rows, and particularly rotenates, and perhaps if I have time, rhodates. The method which became the state of the art approach for this system is the LDA plus DMFT method, which starts from Kuhn-Sham eigenvalues to build Hamiltonians, to build models which are augmented by a local Coulomb interaction, so generalized Hubbard models. Those are then mapped onto some uh, uh, self-consistent quantum impurity model, which remains very hard to, to be solved, and which is typically solved by quantum Monte Carlo in uh, realistic cases. Uh, and as uh, was already mentioned, if you want to know more on uh, uh, these methods and the various aspects, we, we have a website with many, many lecture notes. Now, uh, the difficulty is that with quantum Monte Carlo, we can typically solve only a certain limited uh, uh, type of models, so with a limited number of degrees of freedom and with specific interaction. And uh, so this is different from DFT, where uh, we can solve the full problem in one go. And uh, at least if we want to uh, stay in the situation in which we solve the problem exactly with quantum Monte Carlo. But uh, a lot of progress has been made in the last year so that the complexity of these uh, uh, solvers, uh, um, so the, of the problems that can be accessed, increased uh, dramatically, at least from the point of view of the many body uh, physics. And uh, for example, in my group, we built general uh, codes which can now deal with uh, a realistic Coulomb vertex, like the one that you obtain from ab initio from uh, for constrained LDA, and even with spin orbit interaction. And of course, we did this by exploring the supercomputer center in Ulich, which you see here behind the Queen, which has now been dismissed for a new supercomputer. So uh, what I will show uh, uh, you today are the results which uh, can now be obtained, uh, where we include uh, a general Coulomb interaction and spin-orbit uh, coupling, which were not possible till uh, a few years ago. The system I want to address uh, are uh, Rotenates and uh, uh, materials which are in the same, which involve atoms in the same row. So rotenate have 4D T2G4 uh, uh, configuration nominally, and they are particularly difficult to describe because if you look uh, uh, to the electronic structure, it looks simple, but many, many energy scales are very similar. Not only the Coulomb interaction and the bandwidth, but also hopping and crystal field and spin orbit interaction, and as we will see, uh, terms in the Coulomb vertex that are typically neglected. So you really need a general solver and you need a state-of-the-art quantum Monte Carlo for, for doing that. They are very interesting. So, um, uh, uh, single layer rootnet are particularly interesting, and uh, they are still uh, uh, hotly st uh, studied because, uh, well, from this side of the phase diagram, we have strontium 2 rutinium 4, which is a metal which becomes superconductor at very low temperature. And the nature of this superconductivity it, uh, it's not uh, understood to date. If we then replace strontium with calcium, we remain in this layered perovskite structure, but distortions start to take place. And on this side, we have a, a system which is metallic at high uh, temperature, where it has this LPBCA phase, and then becomes insulating and even magnetic with exotic properties at very low temperature. So uh, we, uh, we start to discuss uh, this system, and in particular, the puzzle of this Fermi surface. 
The Fermi surface is particularly interesting because it gives us information on what site and interaction are crucial at the Fermi level. And those are the electrons which are essential to understand the superconductivity, uh, which remains still a puzzle, as pointed out by Eddie McKenzie in this uh, nice review uh, of uh, 2017. So what is the electronic structure of strontium-2 in your 4? Well, if you do LDA calculation, you obtain a picture like this with the band crossing the Fermi level, which are the T2G band. So one is almost two-dimensional, is the XY band, and two are uh, almost one-dimensional, the XZ and YZ band. We are split by a crystal field splitting, and uh, although I say one-dimensional, two-dimensional, the hoppings are uh, relatively long range. Now, if you calculate uh, uh, the, the band structure of such a system, you expect uh, something like this, straight lines for the quasi one-dimensional bands and the round Fermi surface for the two-dimensional band. And indeed, more or less, this is what you find in LDA. These are calculations. This one, I took it from the paper of Marsin and Singh in 97. The uh, Fermi surface was measured uh, by several groups. So here I'm comparing to the work of the Bacelli with Arpes. And you can see that the LDA Fermi surface and the Arpes Fermi surface are quite similar, uh, at least on a qualitative uh, scale. But if you look to the details, uh, differences start to arise. In particular, here we see that the LDA has degeneracy, which don't exist in experiment, and the relative sheet uh, size um, uh, is not uh, correct. So one started to wonder what is missing. And uh, more or less in the same, uh, the same year, uh, 2000, it was pointed out that uh, uh, this system is actually strongly correlated as a high mass normalization of uh, at least a factor of three. And together with Igor Mazin, by trying to understand NMR experiments, which are crucial for superconductivity, we understood that spin orbit effects are strong. Of course, a lot of work went on since then, but uh, now that uh, we had the means of uh, uh, studying this problem with LDA plus MFT, we really looked at the, uh, this problem with this approach. So the models where the solving is something like this, a tie-binding-like model with open constructed ab initio uh, for the T2G bands, uh, local Coulomb interaction, and the spin orbit interaction whose largest term is the local uh, term. So the result is uh, what we obtain uh, is uh, uh, collected in this picture. Up there, you see the LDA Fermi surface and the LDA plus spin orbit Fermi surface. And as one expects, the degeneracy problem is solved because spin orbit now splits the degenerate bands. So adding spin orbit improves the agreement. However, if we now add correlation, we see LDA, LDA plus MFT, LDA plus uh, spin orbit, LDA plus spin orbit plus MFT. The agreement uh, doesn't really improve, uh, improves, or better, it improves on some sheets, but it gets worse for some other Fermi surface sheets. So the surprising result of a very tough calculation was that the correlation do not improve the agreement, at least uh, not remarkably, so not, do not solve the problem, what we were instead expecting. So uh, to understand this result, uh, we should look at what the self-energy is actually doing to the Fermi surface. And uh, it's uh, simple. If you have a Fermi liquid, uh, the self-energy is modifying the Fermi surface by changing the on-site parameters of our Hamiltonian. So changing the crystal field and changing the spin orbit coupling in this case. And what happens is that both the crystal field and spin orbit coupling are enhanced for this system by Coulomb repulsion. More or less, they double the value with respect to LDA. And these two effects together, they both make the uh, uh, smaller the internal sheet and larger the external sheet, so that uh, uh, one gets better and the other gets worse. And there is no way of tuning U and J parameters to solve this issue. So something is missing. And one might think that is non-local effects, which are not taken into account in uh, dynamic mean field theory. But uh, uh, this in particular because, uh, uh, sorry, because here one could think, OK, the larger discrepancies at some k points, specific k points. But we found that there is a simpler explanation, which is also a general mechanism. 
The Coulomb interaction that we should use in this model, well, typically we use spherical Coulomb interaction, like in the atomic limit. But uh, actually, when you take into account Vanier function and screenings, the Coulomb interaction is not uh, uh, spherically symmetric. And in fact, if you look to CRPA results, uh, they show a, a tetragonal contribution, for example, in this system. And this should be taken into account. Typically, it's difficult because, because you need a, a generalized quantum Monte Carlo solver, and you need to take into account uh, uh, the double counting correction in a proper way. But we solved these issues, so we have this code and we have a solution for the double counting. So we could now include these terms, and now we recover a perfect agreement. Why? Well, uh, what is happening is that this uh, term in the Coulomb uh, uh, tensor, so the difference between the u on the x and the x, uh, x y and the xz orbital, is uh, positive. This is the CRPA uh, value and reduces the crystal field enhancement. So this is the missing force which retunes the parameter so that we can uh, uh, get the crystal field at the end, which is, in this case, very close to the LDA initial value without enhancement. And this is what gives uh, the, uh, the, the final result. So in short, instead of uh, this large enhancement, we have a smaller enhancement, delta prime, which is, uh, for a realistic parameter, basically zero. This is what gives uh, this perfect agreement. And this is a generic phenomenon which will occur in many other multi-orbital systems at the Fermi surface where symmetry is crucial. Now, very recently, I saw that a paper in CONMAT which reanalyzed the problem and confirmed basically our results with a more refined um, high resolution for the emission experiment. Of course, if the spin orbit is important, if the Coulomb interaction is important, this should show up also uh, away from the Fermi surface. And that's why we try to look to conductivity experiment, optical conductivity. And here again, there were a lot of uh, uh, data and even theoretical uh, uh, description based on uh, LDA plus DMFT, which were produced quite well uh, experimental data, except that perhaps the height of the Dodo peak was always a bit too small with respect to experiment, unless you make the Coulomb interaction unrealistically small. But uh, uh, these two work made a coherent picture where uh, the uh, contribution of single orbital or single bands could be uh, identified uh, separately. Now the question is, if spin orbit is, uh, is important, as we found out, does this picture stay? We can, still, can we talk about um, the resilient quasi-particle as we do in this paper or uh, the thermal regime? So we reanalyzed this problem, not only in this system, but also in the uh, tabular layer materials. And what we found uh, is uh, the following. Well, we can reproduce, of course, as they did, uh, well, the experiments uh, qualitatively with and without spin orbit. But the spin orbit interaction uh, is much closer to the data for what concerns the height of the, spare, uh, the peak. And uh, why is it? Because in this specific case, it reduces the imaginary part of the self-energy and therefore enhances the peak at zero frequency. This is still within the single uh, orbital picture. But then we decided to analyze the components of the uh, of, uh, optical tensor, divided in the intra-orbital, inter-orbital, and the rest. So this would be inter in intraband, interband, if there was only bands, uh, orbitals and bands, and however not equivalent in this system. And what we found is that while the intraorbital term is still large, there is also a sizable rest component which changes the picture of, uh, uh, of the uh, conductivity. And this transfer of weight is very important, and, and recently we found it becomes even more important in the uh, single layer rodate where the single particle, the single band picture breaks down completely. Uh, why is this very important? Well, if we think about superconductivity, as was pointed out in this paper already in 2014, if the spin orbit is strong, we have to rethink about the mechanism, how we describe the Cooper pairs. We cannot talk about uh, spin and orbital parts separately. We now have to uh, make a different, uh, uh, a different classification, which perhaps will allow to solve the open questions uh, which we have about pairing in this system. Now, uh, 
if spin orbit is important, uh, uh, what about when we in increase the distortion, so the effect of correlation becomes even larger, what happens uh, when the system becomes an insulator? What happens when we go to calcium-2 ruthenium 4 which is uh, an insulator at a low temperature? So we are on this side of the phase diagram. And as I, told, uh, I was telling you, there are different phase, LPBCA, metallic, SPBCA insulator, paramagnetic insulator, and very low temperature magnetic. So uh, uh, this was a very intriguing problem because initially it was proposed that the metal insulator transition was uh, um, orbital selective in nature. With the XY band, the larger band became uh, staying metallic and the other two bands uh, becoming insulating. But uh, in 2010, we have shown that this is not the case. And uh, uh, so we don't find any orbital selective transition. The metallic phase, all three bands are metallic. And the transition is more associated to the effects of structural distortion associated to the LPBCA to SBBCA uh, change in structure. Uh, so in the ordered phase, in the, um, sorry, in the um, uh, insulating phase also, we find orbital ordering of the type two electron on the XY and one electron in the XZ and YZ orbit. This was somewhat confirmed also by APES, which saw three bands in the, uh, in the metallic phase. But soon after we published that paper, um, New result came out, which uh, um, a new theoretical description came out uh, from uh, uh, Guang Qian Yu in Stuttgart. And he actually used the LDA plus U uh, approach to um, uh, analyze this problem. And the results were quite different from ours. Namely, found that the spin orbit coupling is now the dominant uh, interaction which gives rise to, to the metal insulator transition. Now, uh, as we know, the LDA plus U approach is not the best approach to determine the onset of, the trans of a metal insulator transition because it doesn't describe properly the metallic phase. But nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, he had a point uh, because the spin orbit interaction was indeed neglected in our calculation, and it could be that it plays an important role. So we now reanalyze this problem by using the LDA plus DMFT approach. And what we found is, the, uh, is summarized here. In the metallic phase, we still have a metal with three bands that are fully, uh, all metallic. In the insulating phase, this is uh, without spin orbit and this with spin orbit. You see very little difference. So the spin orbit does uh, very little to the, the onset of the transition. If it does something, it slightly reduces the gap, a phenomenon which is a bit exotic, but you can understand it already in the atomic limit by looking at the effects of, uh, at the multiplets. So this is exactly the opposite of what was found in LDA plus U. So what was wrong in LDA plus U? Well, first, uh, uh, qualitatively, Arthur Fock uh, gives in this specific case uh, exactly the wrong trend, so, so uh, it enhances the gap. But also, uh, uh, a wrong Coulomb interaction was used, which, um, which is this uh, U, U minus J, 2J, U minus 3J form, uh, which is correct for real orbital, but not for spherical harmonics. And unfortunately, this enhances the effect of uh, uh, spin orbit. Uh, that, that I put a warning that it's always important to uh, use the correct Coulomb vertex because uh, you make approximation which can be crucial in some cases. If our uh, model is correct, then it should be uh, possible to uh, use our result to describe also the magnetic phase. This is then the real test of our results. So what about the magnetic phase? So here the debate when we started to work on this was uh, um, uh, two opposite picture. One picture proposed by Guinea Kaliunik was that the spin orbit dominates, the ground state is uh, uh, a J total equal to zero state, and the magnetism arises via the Van Black mechanism. The second picture uh, was proposing that instead there are effective moments uh, with spin one, and the spin orbit is perturbative in nature. So uh, what do our results say? Well, with spin orbit, we find that the ground state is still close to xy orbital order with, the X2, uh, with two electrons in the xy orbital. It's slightly modified, but very close still to this configuration. 
So starting from this, so we calculated the, um, uh, the, the Hamiltonian, and we found that we are closest to a spin one with a perturbative spin orbit coupling. Uh, this is the minimal effective Hamiltonian, which we can calculate, where this is the uh, super exchange coupling, and this is the tensor, the zero field tensor, uh, due to the spin orbit uh, uh, interaction. And with this tensor, we, can, uh, we find the easy axis in the right direction. We can describe the magnetic structure. But also, then we went and, uh, and uh, uh, obtained the spin wave spectra, which we now compare to, uh, the, uh, to experimental uh, measurement from this paper here. And as you see, we can reproduce them quite well. Uh, so this is the, uh, the well, a, so it's the full calculation. We can even reproduce this gap, which is called the pseudo -gold goldstone mode. Perhaps the next speaker will come back uh, to this point. Uh, so it doesn't go to zero because of this anisotropy, special anisotropy of the zero field, uh, field of tensor. So this strongly supports our picture. There is still one debated paper, which is this one, which uh, proposes, which found experimentally a mode which they ascribe to, um, uh, to an amplitude mode. The Hamiltonian they used to interpret is quite close parameter-wise to ours, and the uh, preliminary result indicates that we can uh, put also this mode in this picture, but I don't have the final result yet, while I expect the next speech, speech, speaker to talk about this point uh, later in his talk. What we certainly can exclude that we are so close to these quantum critical points because the parameter that we have, however we look them, already in the atomic limit to show that we are close to a spin one state with a, a perturbative spin orbit effects. Okay, so I guess I'm coming to the conclusion. So I have the last slide uh, of the talk. Uh, here I collect the result which I presented. I've shown you that a work done for this series uh, where, as I said, many, many uh, different interactions uh, which are compete have the same order of magnitude, so it's not easy to uh, simplify the problem by uh, neglecting some of these parameters some, uh, because they are all important in some way or in some regime. We have seen that the Fermi surface, uh, for example, is crucial to include the spin orbit coupling, but also tetragonal uh, symmetry Coulomb terms, which are typically neglected, an effect which is likely to be important in many other materials uh, with multi orbitals. We have found that uh, the spin orbit interaction is also key to interpret uh, correctly the conductivity data, uh, contrary to what has been done so far. For the, for the uh, insulating phase, we confirm our old result that uh, it is the LPBCA to SPBCA transition that uh, is the main mechanism driving the, uh, the, the metal insulator transition, and the spin orbit plays a little role in that if uh, it shrinks a little bit the gap. But uh, it's crucial for magnetism, although it can be treated in a perturbative way. And this is all. Let me thank the people that uh, did uh, the work. Evgeny Gorelov, who uh, developed at least the first version of the continuous time interaction expansion code that we uh, were using, Guang Zhang, which uh, contributed to the spin orbit extension and did most of the spin orbit calculation. And as my Salvastani, we did the, the conductivity uh, calculation. And then I would like to thank you for your attention and the, uh, for more information on uh, our uh, website for the school uh, for the students that are present.